thank you for sitting through this all, all this with us. I'm Christine Stamen, um, and I'm with... I'm Richie. I'm Corey Poffenberg. Um, we're going to be talking about caring for patients with intellectual or developmental disabilities in the ED. Um, so we're going to do this through a case. So you have a 27-year-old male who has a history of autism spectrum disorder to the point that he's nonverbal. And he comes in from his group living facility by EMS because he's been definitely different. Um, in the past two days, he's been actually self-harming, hitting himself in the face, and having issues with the care staff. EMS has been unable to attain full vitals. What they can tell you is his heart rate is fast at 120, and but he's adding good at 100% on remand. So I invite all of you, what barriers are gonna make it harder to care for this patient? Is that me? Communication, right? We can't, he can't talk to us, or he doesn't talk to us. What else? So he gets put into an exam room, and what strategies are you going to use to try and get that history and physical exam? Are we going to use the phone? Well, minimize the number of people in there. Okay. So one nurse, one doctor, maybe. Try to reduce overall stimulation. How would you do that? Um, turn the lights down. Yeah, so we're going to talk about um, some individual best practices, which, um, of course, are influenced by institutional policies and practices as well. And then um, Richie's going to go over the more institutional and organizational best practices. So um, as you guys identified, one of the challenges is communication with someone who is nonverbal. But that doesn't mean that they don't communicate. And so that's where a caregiver can be helpful um, in terms of, you know, maybe the patient has good receptive language and can gesture. Or maybe the patient can use assistive um, communication tools like a picture chart or something like that. And so, again, that information is super helpful. Um, you know, as a foreshadow to what Richie's going to talk about, it would be helpful if we could know that information without having the caregiver there. Like, why doesn't our EHR identify that for us? So, and that's something that also other groups, had, you know, discussed um, in terms of, like, can we make our tools work for us? Um, establishing a patient baseline is critically important in patients who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so, again, a caregiver is very helpful in terms of, you know, what's their normal level of functioning, typical level of functioning, and how is this different? Um, and sources 
again, the caregiver of the group living facility, maybe a primary care physician if you're lucky enough to be able to get that person on the phone, or looking through the EHR and seeing what's documented um, in terms of prior visits and how the patient was um, behaving. Uh, and But again, nobody may have put accommodations or things like a healthcare passport within the EMR. Um, identification of a patient support team, again, very important. Um, those people can help you in the emergency department and also will be critically important when you're talking about discharge planning and things like that. Minimize stimulation, so reduce lighting and noise. These are things you guys identified. Minimize the number of people in the room. Maybe this is not the best medical student teaching case, like limit it um, to the people who need to be there. Um, minimize vital signs unless they're absolutely required. And then remember that all behavior is communication. Um, so you should really assume that there's a medical cause for change in behavior until you've completely ruled it out. So whether they're trying, you know, they're trying to show you that something on their face hurts because that's why they're hitting it, or they're, you know, something else is bothering them, you have to really be thorough in your evaluation. And again, like the blind group was talking about, um, a sign on the door to state what the patient might need, or accommodations to let the whole healthcare team can be helpful, um, so that like you're not people are not walking in there un, un, unknowing what the patient's situation is. Thanks, Corey. So yeah, I think what's going to really benefit the sort of whole healthcare system overall is going to be ability to get this information into the emergency health record, and what we need to do is to clearly identify the different types of disabilities and also specifically ask uh, the patient about what accommodations they need in, in the ED or in different healthcare settings. And I think best ways to potentially do that is through um, screening. I think, you know, part of our triage system uh, with our nursing staff, we go, we have done a really good job of implementing specific questions in our healthcare system. Like we, you know, we talk about suicide assessments for every patient who comes in. We talk about patient safety at home, you know, to screen for domestic violence. It should also be included as well as what accommodations do you need? And then once, you know, uh, you know, especially when someone doesn't have that in their chart already. So ask that question and then um, work on actually documenting it. You know, some of uh, Epic now has in their EHR some little sidebar which says special needs or hopefully, I, I think a better term would be accommodations. But to utilize that to sort of, you know, fill in that area and document all the things that you learn because, um, you know, as we don't have a lot of time, as long as one person takes that time and effort, they can help a lot of other people um, help care for this patient if they're able to read something very quickly about that patient. Um, additionally, um, I think what the other groups have also discussed is ensuring staff awareness is super important. You know, everyone from our nurses to our techs to um, everyone who interfaces with the patient, um, you know, that this patient has a disability, they have accommodations that they may need, and, you know, to either have that on the door I think would be, you know, uh, very helpful until we get that better delineated in our uh, EMR system, but even that might be helpful in the case because not everyone who Inter uh, interfaces with the patient actually goes through the, the, emer uh, the emergency medical record as well. So I think ensuring staff awareness about this, especially about the medical versus social uh, model of disability, uh, the concepts of the international classification of functioning. And I think also one really important one is nonverbal communication and what tools should you go to? Um, how do you establish um, good you know, patient interaction and then try establishing yes nos, try using um, pictures, try using, you know, um, charts of the patient's body where they can point, um, and having a toolkit available in the ED, um, and like a best practice guide is like, which one should you try and use, to try and establish that important back and forth uh, directly with the patient, because even if you have a caregiver and support person there, they might know a change in baseline, they might, not, might, might know what has been a uh, similar presentation in the past, but ultimately at the end of the day, the patient knows what they're experiencing best, and if we can establish that in communication with them, um, that's probably the, the most, like the most accurate information you're going to get from someone. And then I think also very importantly is to include individuals with disabilities and intellectual and developmental disabilities in design of uh, new policies in the ED. You know, having when we're trying to Im do improvements to our EDs, make sure that people with disabilities are you know walking around the new designs, uh, being involved, so that. Um, you know, we're creating environments that are more accessible, less ableist, and then, of course, um, making sure that our EDs are compliant uh, with ADA regulations um, and creating reduced sensory environments, or even in itself, uh, creating for people um, tool like almost like toolkits for for 
or sensory environments where you know maybe you have headphones maybe or or um, you know noise canceling phones sort of um, and have those toolkits available to people when they come in So in this particular case, we used all those strategies and we were able to figure out that he had an ear infection. We got social work involved in case management to make sure that he had the support services at home and made sure he could get home safely. And if possible, you can always try to do an exit interview with the patient to make sure they actually understand what's going on and what the plan is and that they'll have follow-up. And this is really a great place to involve the social work as well as your um, caregivers, especially in cases like this. And then I'm just going to leave this up here real quick. Um, you can take a look at it. With folks like this, um, if you remember head to toes, these are the places that you really need to look and can't miss um, the diagnoses because I think sometimes it, we tend to avoid some of it because it's harder to examine, like the ears. It's like small children. It's really hard to look in their ears sometimes if, if somebody's having pain. Um, so taking a, a quick look at this list while Kyle comes back up to finish everything off. <laughs> 